Warning! This episode contains some strong language. Listener discretion is advised. Tales from the Trunk, reading the stories that didn't make it. I'm Hilary B. Bisniaks. Listeners, I am thrilled today to welcome on another weird little guy here to do some weird little guy stuff. Josh Story, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. I am so happy to be here and to be a weird little guy on this podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, we... we uh, Behind the scenes, listeners, for a second, uh, when we were setting this up, the email thread uh, that we were going back and forth on, getting this scheduled and everything, was just subject line, weird little guys. Perfect way to do it. I mean, I, I as a as a fan of the podcast, I had to, uh, you know, put a reference in there to one of the previous episodes. So. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta. And, and especially, like... When it's something, uh, something I think as monumental as all the weird little guy talk on our hundredth episode uh, back in September with Sarah Gailey, the largest episode that was ever, the largest episode, the most episode ever to happen, mm-hmm. yeah, B- biggest number, yeah. No, this is a this is a small episode compared yeah. to that, even though I, I mean, mathematically, you know, we, we know no small episodes. Yeah. Just, you know, slightly shorter episodes with smaller numbers. You know, I had, uh, I, I, well, I still have the, the friend, um, they, they were studying physics in um, college, and they brought the textbook to me one day, and they were like, there are only three numbers in physics. There is one, there is two, and there is many. And that's, that's how I feel, that's how I feel, um, that's how I feel podcasts go. There, you yeah. Know, you have one or two episodes, and then you have many episodes. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's Pratchett's troll counting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, one, two, many, lots. One, many, too many. Oh gosh, now we're getting into quaternary. <laughs> Before we fall down a math hole, which I feel like, as as humanities people, neither of us is fully qualified to do. I married uh, a math person, so I wouldn't have to math. So. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I I went into computers, so it's. A shock how Ooh. little I know how to math. Mm. It's okay. It operations, be, my is, friend. You never have to math in operations. Just have to I... know how to spreadsheets. Oh, okay. Yeah, spreadsheets. Spreadsheets, I kind of understand enough to scare me. But yeah, um, <laughs> more power to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, love a love a spreadsheet for non spreadsheet. Uh, not tasks that you would not think were a spreadsheet task. Uh, you know, like plotting a book. Mm, oh, so, okay. So I've had this conversation before, but I, when I'm plotting something, whether it's a book or like, a, you know, a tabletop adventure or something like that, I need width when oh, I'm yeah, looking yeah. at it. Like I, I need to go horizontally in the way I'm looking. I can't be scrolling up and down. So mm-hmm. Um, I can totally see uh, plotting in a spreadsheet like that. That makes sense to me. Yeah, got to got to get one of those ultra wide monitors. I, what I need is uh, a meme style murder board with red string. Is what I really need. But yeah, I don't really have room for that um, in our house. So it's unfortunate. Uh, yeah, yeah. I I think I don't I don't know how Macy physically does it, but I know that Macy makes room to pull out a physical murder board when she needs to murder board things. <laughs> that is, that is impressive. Like, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I actually learned to use spreadsheets to plot longer works from Sarah Gailey. Oh, okay. Uh, cause they, um, way back in the day when they were writing river of teeth, uh, huh. Uh, they 
showed me and other Sarah and a couple of other people the the spreadsheet where the original draft of River of Teeth was written, uh, like plotted out. And I looked at that and I was like, that's cool. I'm going to try that. Tried it once and was like, I cannot keep track of as many things as you can, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> like they had, you know, they had the approximate length of the chapter they had what characters were going to be in it they had what uh relationships were going to be in it what uh what subplots were going to be touched on like all these things and i was like that's that's too much i can't do that every time i try to do that i get like halfway through and realize that like most of that information is wasted like yeah it's like the I think the the road trip analogy is what mm-hmm. they use, where you, like you got a general idea of where you're going, but you leave room for the the giant ball of string, yeah, a, a attraction that you want to see, um, yeah, or the um, oh gosh, the world's largest frying pan in Illinois, Ohio, I I. Now I need to go and go back to uh, Jess Best's it... episode to, or, or at least the show notes for that to find out what the there's some oh, right. town that tried to make the world's largest frying pan, and by the time they finished it, uh, they found out that it was not the world's largest frying pan. Right, but it was the largest in like the state. Yeah, so they were technically correct with their yeah. naming. The best kind of correct. Um, so, so getting, getting back to the idea of, oh, and now all of this is, is stuff that I'm not going to use anymore. Why don't we get into the wolf that waits at the end of all things? Oh, okay. Sure. (laughs) You like how I did that? (laughs) Yeah, no, that was a smooth transition and I knew it was coming and yet it was still unexpected. (laughs) Uh, is there anything that we need to know before we get into the reading? Um... So it's it's the first chapter. So if I did my job right, the answer to that should be no. Um, but I should point out that this book is all about um, the death of language and what happens when that when nice. when word when words Crunchy. die. Um, and so there's some visual tricks that when you're reading it, very <laughs> obvious. But when I'm speaking it, and I'm not a professional reader um might might not come across so if you hear me you stuttering on on words or like hiccuping that's uh, that is probably not my um amateur nature <laughs> it is likely intentional and in me trying to replicate something that is visual in the text fantastic all right the proper words to start the story have already died in the storms so fuck it i'm going old school It begins the way these things always do, with a flash of light and a really loud bang. The heavens crack, the sky splits in two, and the night crashes down to the ground in a thousand shards of black glass that, like daggers, like death, slice through the path of two men running for what's left of their lives. Hmm. See my fathers below us, bursting from the tree line, careening around a circle of ancient standing stones and sprinting for cover across this dying grove. Watch their chests, their breath coming quick and panicked, coughing. Rain covers their faces in a drowning veil, stinging their eyes as phlegm-like pockets of mud suck at their ankles. And Brian, he stumbles, but Reese, not even bothering to break his stride, scoops up his husband and runs for the blasted-out stump of the long-dead tree that rises from the center of this clearing like a wicked huge claw made of bark and burnt wood. (sighs) Placed side by side, my fathers are a study in contrasts. Brian Walker is made of sharp angles with brown skins thrown awkwardly across a fragile scholar's frame. He's not from this world. You can tell by the way he works that fact into every conversation he's ever had with anyone. Reese Lockbairn, on the other hand, is built from and for the glory of Spar. He could have been carved from white blue granite if he hadn't already been woven from flesh, faith, and divine grammar. You see, Reese's father, my grandfather, was a true god of the Ragnarun, not a fallen remainder like Ulinglot. And Rhys's strength comes as much from his blood as it does from the dense muscles covering every inch of his body. Hmm. The old stump could hold a full wagon and a team of drommels to pull it. I think it used to be an ash of some kind, maybe a yew. 
I don't know trees, but I know how to spot a ritual site when I see one. And between the ring of standing stones, this ancient trunk, and ground that practically seeps with the blood of annual sacrifice, I'm definitely looking at what's left of someone's sacred space. Hmm. My fathers were out here in the rain, hunting a fallen god called Ulinglot the Nametaker. Catchy title, sort of rolls off the tongue, if you have a tongue for it to roll off. <laughs> Brian and Reese chased down the trail of clues left by Ulinglot's cult. The missing children, the secret priests hiding in the village, and the remnants of obscene rites once thought forgotten. And that trail leads them here, but now my fathers are the ones being chased. By a horde of Ulinglot's cultists, who are all very angry. <laughs> Because Ulanglot's one of the last remaining old gods out here on the borderlands. And if the strange woman in the village is to be believed, it's made desperate promises of salvation in return for blood. Children's blood. As the last knights of Wodium, my friends are technically the only two people left in this world with the knowledge and ability to take down a feral remainder like the name taker. Unfortunately, I am out, Rhys says, emptying his revolver spent casings. Hmm. Brian stutters, trying to speak with a capital S. B bullets. <laughs> Bean, Reese asks. Is that a good word to be using? We may be needing them later. They, they don't always go away, Brian says. And then he says, bullets, and pulls stone from the earth with his words. Hmm. Bullets, he says again, sorting metal from the rocks. Small traces, not much. A speaker like Brian can tap into the linguistic power that suffuses this world, but he needs three things to do it. The first is skill, which he has in droves. The second, conviction. It takes a lot of willpower to mold the grammars of Spar into new shapes. The last thing Brian needs is potential, suggestion of the thing he's trying to shape. Hmm. The less he has of any one of those things, the more he needs of the others. In this case, he needs some metal, but the stones aren't giving up that much. Bullets, he says again, feeling the word drag dangerously fragile along his tongue. The edges of its sounds scrape barbs of pain up his throat as he builds a picture of the ammunition inside his mind. Then he compresses it, condenses it, alchemizes the materials with his words, making lead and gunpowder, sculpting them into an approximation of his husband's need. They won't fly straight, Bran says through a throat filled with gravel but they won't jam either. Mm. Reese nods as he reloads. Can you steady my aim? I can, I can try, but words are... Brian coughs hard, his face screwing up into an agonizing twist. Reese holsters his gun. Thank you, my love. He plants a quick kiss on top of his husband's head. This is true. I will save them for the end when this monster's true face is revealed. And then Reese hefts an axe instead. Above them, the shatterstorm rages. Below, what's left of the rocks and the grass and the trees try to weather the pounding rain. Between us, leaves shudder and shake on the ends of weak branches. But that word, leaves, it's getting a little loose. It mm. rattles in the brain, wiggles like a tooth with a rotted root. Oof. Leaves, it becomes. And then, lit vez, as the vowels hitch in the throat. Leave. Lev, le, le, le. A storm this strong will have the whole grove forgotten and gone by the end of the night. Before that, though, the very idea of foliage will disappear from this part of the world, leaving our minds tonguing the remains of a ruined concept bereft of signifier. Another flash of lightning, another rumbling boom. The cult seeps from the shadows at the edge of the ancient grove. For protection against the storm, they wear hoods made from the skin of their dead children. For violence against my fathers, they wield weapons made from rusted sides and broken plowshares. Their numbers, many. Their god, angry. And they have come to see my fathers bleed. I told Brian this was a bad idea, all the way back at the start. But did he listen? Just ten more. Brian does math in his head. Maybe twelve, then the remainder will be forced to reveal itself. When this world is as broken as it is, Brian said this morning before we set out, you work with what you've got. Which sounds nice and heroic, but practically speaking, it means we're stuck out here, alone, mm. no backup, no shelter, a storm unmaking the forest around us one drop at a time. 
We must get you out of this rain, Reese has to yell over the crash of thunder, even though he's standing right next to his husband. This is true. No one's arguing that, Brian says, between fits of coughing. But we're not leaving without Ullenglot's heart. We need to, deep breath, finish this. Another cough. There isn't time to argue. The cannibals break from the forest, at least 30 strong, running for the tree stump, screaming as their skin bubbles under the unmaking rain. Their screams are prayers, though, prayers to the name taker. The syllables of their litanies rise up into the night, and after only a moment, maybe two, pus filled ulcers split across their skin, leaking a muted pink purple light. The light drips down their chests, collects around distended bellies. Then, mid stride, the cultist's stomach split open. Their guts erupt in a flurry of gnashing teeth and barbed, whip-like tongues. Suddenly, my fathers are not facing down just 30 angry cannibals. They're facing down 30 angry mutant cannibals with <laughs> writhing intestinal tentacles. That's new, Brian gasps for a lungful of air. Reese yells as he widens his stance. Ready yourself? The horde slams into the outer wall of the stump, weapons raised, extra tongues screaming blasphemous songs into an empty sky feeding their baby-eating god with grammar in the form of prayers. Those prayers drift upward, overhead, where more shards of what used to be the sky slice down, shearing off branches, slicing through the standing stones, and sticking into the ground like daggers in flesh. Dylan! Reese shouts to the sky. Your fathers need you! And that's my cue. I'm up here with the storm, staying well out of the nonsense my fathers have gotten themselves wrapped up in. Sky, rain, and darkness. That's the company I keep tonight. It's lonely and cold up here ever since the were forgotten. Mm. But I still remember the pinpricks of light tickling my skin. Back when I still had skin. Back before I was dead. Before Brian killed me. Lightning cracks. Crack. Boom. I really hate this part. <sighs> Bang. Woo! Oh gosh, I'm getting it. It it's it's giving machineries of empire mixed with Jasper Ford, mixed with epic fantasy. I love it. This is probably my favorite first chapter that I've ever written in my life. <laughs> That's it. You know, I haven't I haven't read any of your other first chapters, but I'm with you. Um, that's because most of the other first chapters I would never impose upon anyone. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very slim selection of those, so. Yeah, yeah. Now, mood, mood. I was, I don't remember specifically why I was thinking of it, and I, I have the hard drive. I don't know, I don't have anything to connect it to my computer and don't know if anything <laughs> off of it is rescuable. <laughs> but I was I was thinking about the first novel that I tried to write uh, in 1999 or 2000. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The other day, I don't I I don't know what reminded me of it except that I had a full body cringe. <laughs> oh man, I, yeah, you know yeah. I was a uh, uh, and. An adolescent at the time. <laughs> I I think my my very first chapter ever is on a zip disk somewhere <laughs> in my parents' basement, and I know my dad still has the drive, um, which definitely cannot connect to a modern computer without many um, yeah. jury rigged uh, adaptations, adapters, and dongles strung together. Uh, but I don't think I ever want to try because yeah. I don't remember anything about it, but I remember how derivative it was of like everything that I, I loved at the time. And like, you know, like mm. yeah, it's though, those things are so wild because they come from a place of absolute genre awareness and zero genre savvy at all. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to try this thing that no one has ever tried before, narrator. Mm -hmm. 20,000 people have tried that before. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I I think 
I started writing mine because my friend sent me the first couple chapters of the book that he was writing, which was uh, Final Fantasy fan fiction. <laughs> uh, like, but also, oops, all OCs at the same time. Like, I don't. Okay. Yeah, like, file you know, off the serial take, numbers take of that. So. A, a Final Fantasy world. Populate it with OCs, but then also, like, there are basic Final Fantasy items around, I think. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, it it was, you know, we, we've all we've all been teenagers. Uh, listeners, if you're out there and you're still teenagers, we love you. We believe in you. Uh, and don't pin all your hopes on your first book. No, but also I'm guessing if they're teenagers now, they're probably better teenager than I was when I was a teenager. So yeah, yeah. No, I I think I think all of the the teenagers out there pretty much are are doing better in a lot of ways. Like you know, certainly there's a a lot. They're a lot queerer, and that's important. That's a big first step, honestly. Yeah. Just think just think about all the books that just wouldn't have been written and then thrown out immediately if, like, you could just not have been growing up in the homophobia of the 90s and early 2000s. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, but... I mean, I'm not not defending the the homophobia of the nineties. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah. Long shot, but like also like that, like the, the the fan fiction culture of that time is what gave us the authors that were brave enough to write like the queer books that we had. That's now. true. That's so, true. You I know, mean, like it it wasn't all cringe for nothing. It wasn't all cringe. For, we if we didn't have, and and this is not to say anything disparaging about Homestuck. I've never actually consumed it. If we didn't have Homestuck, we wouldn't have the Locked Tomb. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, I, um, yeah. I, I, I would love to, uh, to get away from uh, the, the cringe and, and with a uh, note, as Mary Baker says, kill not that of you that cringes uh kill not that of you that is cringe kill that which cringes <laughs> love that uh good good words to live by uh what uh what was kind of your process with the wolf that waits at the end of all things in terms of the the narrative arc of writing this book putting this book away so <sighs> This was the first novel I ever finished. Um, and about three quarters of the way through, and also, like, it took me near close to a decade to, mm -hmm. to finish it, um, to figure out what the fuck I was doing um, <laughs> in terms of plotting things. It went through, it started out as a short story. Mm -hmm. um, yep, and then uh, I gave it to people, and they were like, "Oh, this there's so much in here. This could be so much bigger." Also, like I say, short story. It was like it was about ten thousand words. Right, um, right. But, um that is n not a short story by anyone's um, <laughs> definitions, except three very specific publications who, um, right, yes, all rejected it right away, and rightfully so. Um, and uh, my, you, know, you know, my my friends and my readers were like, "You have so much in here." Like it should be longer. I'm like, okay, I can make it a novella. That I can, I can <laughs> squeeze a novella out of this. Um, and then I got to the end of the novella, and I was like, shit, I just figured out how to make it a novel. Um, and so that's like three years into the writing because I'm trying to find time in between, right, yeah. you know, having a day job and and having a life and you know raising a dog, and um, uh, and also trying to fit in all of the video games that I want to play in my life. And yep, you know, just life life stuff being lifey and getting in the way of making up fantasy blurbos and dying yeah. <laughs> um 
So I was like, all right, it's going to be a novel. And I, I, I dove in and I was expanding the novella and I was adding chapters and scenes. And at some point I asked myself, like, when do you know <laughs> to give up? Because you hear, right. you hear like everyone saying, like, your first novel is going to be crap. Mm -hmm. Like, you, you're going to shelve your first novel, like, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, well, then what's the point of finishing this? Um, and, and the point is learning how to do it, but also like, um, Mary Robinette, uh, gave me some great advice when I asked her the specific question, like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like three quarters of the way through this and I don't, it's my first novel. I don't know what it, it help. <laughs> and she said, look, if everyone's telling you that they like it and mm -hmm. if if you can't point out anything specific about it that's wrong, then all you're feeling is doubt and imposter syndrome and don't listen to it. If you can point mm -hmm. to something and you say you can say, okay, this is what's wrong, then yeah, go fix that. But if it's just this general feeling of nothing is right, then then ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, so I did, and that got me to the end. And I'm very proud of the fact that I wrote this novel um and Hell then yeah. i yeah it was, it was an accomplishment um and it is to be celebrated um even if you know we know the ending of this um right <laughs> well the ending of this currently is that you're on tales from the trunk yeah exactly <laughs> so um so after um i i finished it and i polished it up and i got comments from from beta readers i was like okay I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to put on my helmet. I'm going to go into the querying trenches. Mm -hmm. um, and I did, and I got a great cover letter. I came up with an awesome pitch. Um, I had my comps, I was ready and I go in there and I'm in there for a couple of years. Um, and while I'm in there, um, I'm also working on my next novel right. and yeah. taking everything that I've learned from the first one and realizing that this, um, this, 150,000 word um, <laughs> chihuahua killer that I have written <laughs> that is um, very queer and also very weird because there's a lot of semiotic bullshit going on mm -hmm. in the novel with words disappearing and their uh, attachment to concepts and like <laughs> what happens when like the, the articles of a sentence start disappearing. And I'm like, maybe maybe this isn't actually marketable as a first novel <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Weird. I, I, I couldn't say. <laughs> um, and over the course of, you know, writing my next novel and plotting out the ones after that and all the experience that I gained, um, I was able to start seeing the flaws in the book. Mm -hmm. um, the length you know, kind of being one of them. Um, but also it's just the amount of crap I tried to, ram into it right yeah um and so as i was finishing up my next um novel i was like which is very different it it, mm -hmm. it leans much more into the comedy it's modern day it's not secondary world so there's a lot less you know lifting i have to do to bring uh, it was like I, I i tell friends that it was it was like i was weight training with the first mm -hmm. novel it was everything that i had to do in that one and then as soon as i got to write something simpler it was like bam yeah it's like rock lee dropping the weights and yeah. episode of naruto um but then i looked back at it and i was like you know what i can make it better i can fix it um mm -hmm. uh so i i decided that um i would shelve it for the time now that i have something else i wanted mm -hmm. to keep it going while i was working on something so that i built up the habit of querying and right. got over the fear of sending it out there. Um, and, and now that I have something else to send out, now mm -hmm. I can go back, I can shelve this, and I can think about it, and I can maybe maybe tinker with it. I'm not abandoning it. Mm -hmm. um, I've got ideas, and I'm playing around with those ideas, and I'm, 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 I'm restructuring it. It might become a novella again, but like a series of them instead of just one, because there are there's still a shit ton of stuff in here yeah yeah that's um it's it's really interesting that you say 
the the part about like just cramming so much stuff into this book um we were uh in the fandom discord for the murderbot diaries that i'm in uh we have been talking a lot about the new murderbot diaries book system collapse uh listeners if you haven't go back and listen to last month's book tour highly recommend martha wells super brilliant fun times um but talking about how uh because system collapse is a novel in length but reads uh it's it's about 60,000 words long so like short novel mm-hmm. uh but comparable in length to say a wizard of earthsea which mm-hmm. I, I think is like 56,000 words or something like that but like very short novel slim volume love it but that system collapse began as a novella and just kind of got a little bit out of control because it that's how it needed to be right uh but it is still structurally a novella in terms of the amount of uh the amount of stuff that happens and the level of focus in it versus something like A Wizard of Earthsea, which is undeniably a novel, has always been a novel, has a novel's worth of shit that happens in it, but just happens to be a very compact book. Right. Right. Um, and I, oh, man. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just and just thinking just about, thinking about like, the, the differences the there. Time. And there's... <sighs> There's a skill in language to the like. I mean, Le Guin was like a master at right, yeah. making a sentence do twenty things with like four words. Mm-hmm. Um, that you know, I I didn't have when I when I wrote this. Um, that I, I probably still don't have. That that's like something that you hone over a lifetime. Yeah, uh, and and also like there's like I think I think with a, with people's first novels, um, or at least the the. Not not like the not like the very first one, not the the one where you opened up a Word doc and wrote three pages and mm. you're like, I'm going to make this a novel and then <laughs> never. Um, I'm talking about like the, the first time you have like a substantial manuscript. Mm-hmm. I think there's a little bit of sunk cost fallacy that goes into it. Of you look at how much time you've spent on this. Mm-hmm. And like, I have so many ideas. How much I, am I going to be able to get them all out? Well, let's all cram them into this thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like instead of you know going out to a nice dinner in a simple you know sleek get up you end up you know decking out like you're going to the met gala um and it doesn't it doesn't fit all together you, just you to know. go to applebee's yeah exactly <laughs> like get up here. i have to ask how did you know what i went to applebee's in last weekend um well you didn't see me but i saw you we'll <laughs> leave it at that um yeah there so that is something uh my i've i've talked about this a million times before on the podcast because it's my podcast and i don't shut up that's my job uh about the first story that i tried to sell and uh the amount of, you know, because I was a teenager trying to sell my first short story and putting just so much weight on this having to be it and this having to be, you know, I I have to sell this first story and it is, it has to win me a Hugo Award. Mm-hmm. And get and, the movie deal made out yeah, of it. And... All, like all of that. And, ha- you know, hanging everything off of it and it taking years to let go of that and still uh, there are parts of it that I am still unpacking like, oh, no, this actually is a cool idea and I want to use it, but not in this thing anymore. And so, like, I just... I I wrote a flash piece literally last night, uh, just like zero draft, barfed it onto a page after shower thoughting it for a week, 
uh, to try to get something ready before uh, Baffling closes for their current submissions call. Who knows if that'll happen or not? Uh, you know, I, I between now and then, I have to turn it into something that looks like a story and have, have to figure out what actually a story looks like, all of that. But like... If you figure that out, you yeah, know, please, fi- figuring that you out. Have my email taking... address. Um, just, just slide it. Just slide it and let me know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, but like taking, you know, here's this central hook of a story that I wrote almost twenty years ago. Like, here's the central MacGuffin. I am going to scoop it out of this hard-boiled urban fantasy genre unaware, genre unsavvy piece of work that I love and appreciate for what it did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am going to hurl it raw onto, into 300 words of feelings about gender. I mean, the, that, that, those concepts, those ideas, they're, they're knocking around inside your brain. Yeah. Right. And like, at different points in your life, you're just not ready to actually comprehend the connections that you're making. Mm-hmm. And, and that, that's where the experience comes in, right? Like you look back and you go like, oh, oh, I was actually talking about this thing. Okay, I can make that a lot clearer now. Yeah. Um, and figuring also some... out like what the, what the shape of the thing actually is. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of the time it's like, I've dropped a, a a teaspoon of jam into this jar. And I don't, jam isn't the right. I, mean, I, I can't, I, I don't have words today. Apparently I think they've all been eaten. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, finding, finding the thing that is the right shape for the concept that you had previously. Yeah. It's like, it's like when you watch a movie and you're like, wow, there was such an interesting subplot that they did absolutely nothing with. Mm-hmm. And it, the whole movie would have been so much better if it had just been about this. Yeah. And it's so easy to say that when you're watching someone else's work, like complete in front of you. And so mm-hmm. you can like armchair quarterback it and whatever. And, and when you get, and then the... you hop onto AO3 and make <laughs> that thing. Yeah. Um, but then when you can, when you've got enough space um, between your work, like that's, I, I think that's why they always say like, don't start editing as soon as you finish, you know, like mm-hmm. set it aside and like, yeah, that's fine. But also like, I'm really horrible about um, waiting until Christmas to mm-hmm. give the people I love their Christmas gifts. I want them to open it up now as soon as I, I wrapped it. Um, yeah. And it's I, the I made with- the special thing. Yeah, like here, look, look. If this is for you, enjoy it. Uh, yeah. I know Christmas is uh, in in December and it is March, but please do. <laughs> um, and it, I think it it's the same. It's the same with writing. Like you're just like, okay, I I set it aside for like five hours. I can go back to it, right? No, mm-hmm. you, need, you need you need time. You need you need that space to yeah to see the things that you didn't see before. Yeah, yeah, and sometimes I mean. Ideally, that's, you know, a couple of weeks, a couple of months, maybe. Sometimes it's a decade. Sometimes it's two decades. Sometimes, you know, um, I, I think I've I've talked about this before. The I have a game that I published on Itch last year uh, called All Our Yesterdays. It's a, a solo journaling game about uh, being... Traveling back in time to keep somebody who had died alone company in their last moments. Oh. (laughs) And I wrote three short stories around that before I realized that it was a journaling game, actually. Oh, man. Like... Like if you if you pitch that concept as a short story to me, I'm like, oh man, that that's really cool. Like I I love reading Gaiman's death, yeah, um, and I, I I love the vibe of that. I would I would probably read that short story, but then you tell me it's a journaling game, and like I haven't even played it, and my heart is cracking open. Like what the 
Go check it out. Pay what you want on yeah. itch.io. Uh, it, it, I even formatted it so you can print it out as a beautiful little zine and staple it together. Oh, just kiss, man. Because I wow. fucking love a zine. Like, oh, who yeah. doesn't love a zine? Uh, boring people, that's who. Boring people, that's right. Damn right. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that's that's the thing, right? Where it's like, it took me, I think, I probably wrote the first draft of that short story, of the short story that eventually became All Our Yesterdays in 2013, when mm -hmm. my spouse sent me a text that was just a picture of something that she saw on the Muni in San Francisco going between job sites for her work. That there was just like this empty pair of kicky boots on the Muni car. And I was like, oh yeah, a time traveler had to leave those behind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why, why did a time traveler have to leave those behind? Oh, because they had were trying to smuggle back to their time an artifact that... You know, there's there's a weight limit on time travel, obviously. Of uh, course, that makes sense. You know, your your conservation of mass or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and they're trying to bring this thing back. What are what could they possibly be trying to bring back? Oh, it's something from that belonged to uh, their you know dead relative who died alone in the hospital, unloved. Shit. Yeah. Damn. Okay. <laughs> And then, and then wrapped, you know, two and a half thousand words around it three or four times, tried to sell it a couple dozen times, never, never got anything anywhere out of it. And eventually was like, eventually got onto a kick of journaling games because I was, uh, nerd alert listeners, because I was listening to friends at the table and... Uh, they played a couple of different, really interesting, uh, like hacks on solo journaling games in at the end of their song Fiel season. Okay, and uh, and I just got really into uh this one game that they played, Anamnesis. Uh, links in the show notes, uh, both to the episode which will make no sense if you haven't listened to any of the rest <laughs> of Songfiel, uh, but also to the game. Uh, but, like, got really into the idea of journaling games and got into this idea of, like, oh, actually, like, I love this shape of a thing, and, oh, this is how... This is the shape that the concept was, right? Yeah, man. <laughs> I have... So you know, maybe some of the some of the stuff that's hanging around in this book is actually a role playing game. Um, I mean, <laughs> confession to uh, any of the players in my current Pathfinder game, but I stole <laughs> several of the concepts um, when I had to pants something. Uh, for hey. them they went in a direction that I didn't go. I was like, "Well, I've already got the world building for this, so here yep. you go." Yeah. Yeah, and I mean that like that's the that's the thing. I'm I'm medium on Brandon Sanderson. Okay. Uh I I have enjoyed a lot of his books. I uh have have some feelings about the amount of money and acclaim that he has, uh, which are, are neither here nor there, but uh going going back to you said you talked to Mary Robinette at Coal for listeners who might not have made that connection there uh about the wolf that waits at the end of all things on uh the writing excuses podcast way back i don't remember how many years ago this would have been uh cuz that show's been running since like five ever right um and we love that for them. Way, way, way back, 
uh, Brandon Sanderson said something that has stuck with me uh, and that I've like, you know, when you when you just like something so much that you just have to rotate it in your head a, lo- a bunch. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, he said this thing, which is that when he gets stuck on a novel, which like the pace he puts novels out that I, must only be for a couple of minutes, but who knows? I, I was going to say, like, good, it's stuck because he has to, like, pick up the, the laundry or... or <laughs> I don't <yeah>. know. <laughs> but when he gets stuck on something that he just goes and writes shitty song lyrics or, <laughs> like, you know, writes an overwrought poem or, like, draws something... Uh, but this idea of like you can just because you're stuck on this one thing doesn't mean you can't still doesn't mean you don't still have the the drive to create and doesn't mean that the energy to create isn't uh doesn't carry potential right man that makes so much sense <sighs> like <sighs> And I mean, that's okay. why Brando Sando has so much money. Well, I mean, there's that, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm just thinking like, okay, so um, this is a side tangent story about my dog. Um, Please. So um, my dog is a, a, he's a wonderful little guy. I love him so much. Um, he's, um, he, 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 he's a little bit agoraphobic. Uh-huh. Uh, yep. Would, would you say of... he's a, a weird little guy who does weird little things? I would I would say that. He might yeah. not say that. He would say that he's perfect and um never I mean, does anything weird. Perfect. But um so like one of the things that we're we're trying to do to help him relieve his anxiety about leaving the house, which he has to do because he doesn't have thumbs, so he can't live on the internet like we do, mm-hmm. um is um redirecting his focus, right? Because like much yeah. like his owners, he can hyper focus on something, <laughs> and and not see anything else in the world. Gets the tunnel vision on the one thing, mm-hmm. um, and then probably we got for to... the best, he doesn't have access to the internet though. Probably, yeah, because um, then, oof, boy, yeah. Um, but so you you train him to redirect his focus away from the thing that is causing him anxiety. And like the idea of like, when you get stuck and you're, you're hyper-focusing on like, I don't, there's what else, there's nothing. I've written myself into a corner. I've, I've spent the last five years working on this novel and it is now 145,000 words and I don't know how it ends. Mm-hmm. Like, when you suck, you get stuck on that. You have to, you have to redirect the focus. You have to release the vent somewhere else so that mm-hmm. when you come back to it, you've got fresh eyes, you calm mind and realize that it's not the end of the world. Well, in yeah. the case of this novel, it was because it's an apocalyptic novel, but you know. Right, right, yeah. Potato but like that, that's that's the the literal metaphorical world, not the just metaphorical world that it's the yes. end of. Yes, theoretically, hopefully. <laughs> I think I've got that straight in my head. I think I understood I mean, that. Words I'm are gonna all... Pretend, I'm going to pretend I understood that. Yeah. <laughs> words are all constructs anyway like we're we're gonna get into some semiotic bullshit before long oh yeah i mean that's what yeah exactly <sighs> um i i i want to loop back around also to just make a plug uh because you mentioned again talking to mary robinette about this uh listeners if you have access to ask mary robinette koal a question about writing do it oh man like uh, if if you i believe if you support her patreon that that gives you access to a- ask her occasional questions about writing and i'm here to tell you uh worthwhile i can confirm um have entire notebooks uh filled with their words of wisdom um because i've taken several of their uh several of mary robinette's courses and yeah. um is well worth well worth the price of admission um and 
they, the, the fact that she can just like pop out the answer mm-hmm. um, like she was expecting you to ask it. Yeah. Um, it just speaks to both her 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 wisdom and her caring for um, fledgling authors. Yeah. Um, and the fact that I... she's trying to make trying to make the world better for us is is admirable. Yeah. Uh, the the other story I know I've told m- multiple times, but uh, bears re-mentioning here. Uh, I have a, a what I describe as a Sisidman horror story in uh, the uh, late great Lamplight magazine, which I had written. I had struggled with figuring out exactly what was wrong with it. Mary Robinette and Charlie Finley showed me how to sell that story. And between them, uh, helped me rearrange literally two sentences and sold it to the next place I sent it to, which was Lamplight. Hell yeah. Like, I, I would not have been able to do that if I hadn't taken... Mary Robinette's short story intensive and then and gotten a personal rejection uh, back before Charlie had even taken over at F- FNSF, but during his second like trial run issue there, mm-hmm. uh, he I, I sent him this story and he sent back, you know, one of one of those very kind, thoughtful Charlie rejections that uh People who submitted to FNSF during his run uh, hopefully are are familiar with. <laughs> uh, and, like, I think I had gotten that rejection right before the intensive. Took the intensive and finished it and was immediately like, oh, that's what Charlie meant. Because it, <laughs> it ended up just being... Uh, mice quotient thing yeah it was lit like and and switching the first two sentences of the short story Uh uh-huh solved those parentheses and then jacob Haddon bought it i mean um so if you're if you can and you're able uh support mary robinette's patreon because it is worth every penny um but even if you can't i'm i know she has posted in the past on social media somewhere and probably i think on um on her blog um her version of the mice quotient and Mm -hmm. if you don't know what um the mice quotient is it's a way of structuring a story kind of like html tags yeah and like as soon as she started explaining that in in the intensive because i also took the intensive at, at a different time um it, this 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 light bulb flipped in my head. I'm like, oh, that's why that's why my yeah. scenes aren't landing correctly. And oh, and the the ones that I had in the past gotten to land in the right way, it's because I was accidentally doing these things. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, highly highly recommend uh, if you are trying to diagnose what is wrong with your story because you know that there's something there but you can't put your finger on it. Um, yeah, it's a. Yeah. It's it's a top method. Um, I I will also uh, make a plug for uh, and and links to to Mary Robinette's explanation. I I think she's got one on her blog that I can find. Will be in the show notes. Um, the other, I think, kind of related thing um, that's. I guess more of a, a method of picking that apart, but um, Macy uh, from Be the Serpent uh, talked about this, uh, about her murderboarding method uh, back on uh, Dearly Departed Rekka RJ Theodore's podcast. Um, and there is an episode that should still be in the We Make Books feed, which I will link as well, where Macy, like, live on air, talked Rekka through 
Because Macy uses murderboarding, like, in situ while writing the the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, But talked Rekka through using murderboard, the murderboard method to revise uh, the the third book in the Peridot Shift uh, series. And uh, I th- I think that's really helpful. I think it's a really cool method to try out. So, you know, if listeners, if you're especially, you know, the hopefully you're taking a rest if you participated in NaNoWriMo. Oh, uh, please, please. Please, please rest. <laughs> please rest. Take care of yourself. Writing 50,000 plus words in a month wrecks you. At it can be worthwhile. It's not for everybody. Please rest. And I'm guessing that you you probably also had a job. Yeah. Um, and you know, other other life obligations. Like if you if you were able to go um, lock yourself away in a cabin for all of Nano and 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 write those fifty thousand words, like uh, take me next time. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but for the rest of us, like ooh, get yeah. some sleep. My first nano win was 2020, which, um, that was a lot. That yeah. Was, oh, was... how, <laughs> um, <laughs> speaking of not having words, like, was, whoa, okay. Yeah. <laughs> My friend, what, what, I guess we processed um, it all in different ways. Yeah. But if you are staring at this novel shaped object, um, whether or not you have finished it, because uh, winning Nano does not mean that you have to have finished the book. It is perfectly fine to come out with 50,000 words or more or less. Any amount of words you write in Nano is a win. Uh, and uh, not have a completed book. That is very reasonable. That is the only thing I've ever done with NaNoWriMo is complete, <laughs> is, is create unfinished novel drafts. Uh, but those are are some useful resources to look at for either diagnosing why you can't make the ending that you haven't written yet land in your head so that it can come out your fingers, or figuring out how to edit this book now that you've done it. Um, and oh, as as someone who has uh, you know. As I said, uh, took in like taking like a decade to write a single novel, yep. um, and then you know, decided to just you know, put it in a drawer somewhere and forget about it for a while. Um, the even like the the stuff you learn in Nano isn't just your successes, mm-hmm. right? Like it Nano, if you do it, can be an intense time that is a not really replicatable replicate. Re- not replicable. Okay, replicable. I, I I have a master's degree in English. I can make up words. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, throughout the rest of the year, it, um, but it, it's a microcosm, uh, like a, a pressure cooker of mm-hmm. all of the best and all of the worst parts of, of writing. And if you came out of that with nothing but like three hundred pages of drivel that you do not want to show anyone then take that as a win for knowing what mm-hmm. doesn't work for you. Um, and because some of us took many years writing a short story that became a novella, uh, <laughs> that became a novel that's going to become no- more novellas uh, <laughs> to figure out that stuff. If you can do that and in And maybe month, a tabletop game also. A tabletop game, we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It... I I don't know I don't know if this came through uh came through the, the the zoom for you but I just heard this really weird sound in the room the podcast room and and this blue police box just showed up and I'm wondering Josh if if at this point we can take a step into this time machine I know we've already been offering a lot of uh a lot of hindsight to our past selves but if we can take a step into this time machine and go back and offer some words of wisdom to younger writer Josh and by extension to our listeners. Oh boy. Uh, I, the, 
I've always wanted a chance to to walk through those those doors. I, I um, it, it doesn't look like it's going to be very big from the outside. Oh, it's it's much smaller on the outside. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, uh, if I Matt, uh, advice to 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 younger Josh, um, you hate it when tech bros say it, but when writers say it, I think it is uh, a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, write fast and break things. Like, oh yeah, we do hate that when tech bros say it, but it is super fucking applicable. Right? Like, it. just get it wrong. Mm -hmm. Don't worry so much about it being perfect. Like, it doesn't, this, your first one, your, your second one, your fifth one, it doesn't have to be the one. Like, just just write shit down and finish it and then move on. Like, you have so many ideas. Yeah. They're, they're not going to run out and they don't all have to go in the same book. Yes. <laughs> Please, dear God, don't try to put all of your <laughs> ideas into the same book. Stop and put it. them into a series of novellas. Exactly. Yeah. Easy peasy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, boy, I wish I wish that uh, you could have come back and, and told me that in, in 2005 or so. It, yeah, I, I still don't need to tell myself that. So. Yeah. <laughs> hoping by saying it on a podcast that I will remember that I said it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Phew. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, um a couple of a couple of things before we sort of wrap up here. Uh first Josh, is there anything that you're involved in that you have uh, coming out in the present, uh, in the recent past to the near future that you would love our listeners to know about? Ooh, okay. Um, so I, I, I just recently uh, came on staff at gnomestew.com. Um, a word? Yeah. They're a, if, you, if you're unaware of the stew, it is a tabletop RPG blog. They do a lot of great reviews and thoughts about um, game mastering and, and running games and playing in games. Um, nice. they also, yeah, they're part of the Misdirected Mark podcast network. So they've got a lot of really cool podcasts to listen to when you're not listening to Tales from the Trunk. <laughs> um, yeah. I've got a couple articles up there um, that I'm pretty proud of, and I'm really excited to write more for them. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Um, and um, if you if you haven't yet, Sarah Gailey's uh, Personal Canons Cookbook series, um, which yes. Hillary, I know you are a part of. Yeah, um, the the mac and cheese recipe that oh. you talked about. Oh, it's so good! <laughs> it's so good. One of, one of my friends wrote to me on Thanksgiving and was like, "I just made your mac and cheese recipe for the family for Thanksgiving. Thank you." And I was like. Oh, you got just the Thanksgiving. <laughs> you got the Thanksgiving make, not even just like I'm gonna try this one night. You like Thanksgiving, dang. Yeah. Um, that's wrapping up uh, because it was just for this year. Um, but um, so um, pretty much all of the recipes are out there now, except for the the, the December ones, which will be coming out um, in a couple weeks. And yep. um, there are amazing essays that will make you laugh and make you cry and um, also, uh, if you follow the recipes, we'll make really good meals. So. Really good meals. I've cooked some of the things out of the cookbook. And uh, I know that uh, Hector Gonzalez has a recipe that's about, uh, should be dropping right around the time this episode drops. Mm. Um, I, I haven't read the essay or seen the recipe, but I know the food that Hector cooks. They are incredible. Um it's it's good. <laughs> Spoiler alert, they're both really good. <laughs> yeah. Uh and I believe Amal is the other uh recipe for this month. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so um yeah. you know if if you've never heard of Amal other than through Bigalus Dickalus 
Um, <laughs> I cannot believe that that was this year. I was about to say that happened this year, and that it seems like a lie. Uh, but time is, I mean, we know time is fake, but like... Eh, it's a flat circle. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah. This is how you lose the time war by Amal Maltar and Max Gladstone, as seen on Twitter, posted about by Bigelus Dickless, Nicholas <laughs> Wolfwood. Uh, uh, okay. Also watch Trigun Stampede, season one. Yes. Mm, man. Uh, which also was this year? That, it seems, again, like a lie. I, uh-huh. I, I feel like I watched that well, I mean, I watched the original Trigun in yeah. college, but <laughs> but the the Stampede gave me the same feels that mm-hmm. the original that the original series did. Yeah, yeah, I watched the original on VHS. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oof. I remember running to Suncoast Video when the new volume oh would God. drop. And... I had forgotten Suncoast video was a thing that existed until just now. Oh man, I loved Suncoast video. That's why my current manuscript that I'm working on takes place in a Suncoast video that is connected to an interdimensional portal. Incredible. Um, <laughs> L space, but for video rental stores from the nineties. Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Oh, do check out both Triguns, honestly. Uh, while we're, while we're talking about, uh, media, the sort of the wider media landscape, uh, Josh, is there anything that you've been particularly enjoying that you want our listeners to check out? Uh, any role-playing games, any video games, uh, any books, any, anything really? Um, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. Uh, how much time do we have? Um, okay, so if I have to pick just one, I'm gonna say go watch Monarch on um, Apple TV Plus. Oh, hell it's, yeah, it's the Godzilla TV series. Um, it is amazing. They do, um, this is very minor spoiler for the first <laughs> episode, so if you don't want to hear it, put fingers in your ears or just you know, skip forward, yeah. but they do this amazing thing with one of the characters has PTSD from a, from a Godzilla attack. Uh huh. They use her PTSD flashbacks as a way of keeping Godzilla present in oh a narrative that is just essentially about, um, people figuring out like this conspiracy. That's incredible. It was brilliant. Cause they can still have like big monster destroying city, but the whole series doesn't become about running away from big monster. Holy shit. I um, love Kaiju. Oh, it's so good. It, it mm, so good. Um, other than that, um, if you want to read something good, um, delicious in dungeon, um, dungeon meshi, I think is the original name is oh, uh-huh. a manga that is soon to become an anime that is basically like um, Master Chef mixed with D and D. Incredible. Uh, yeah, it's great. I love um, how I love how manga gets to do the bullshit. Right. <laughs> Manga just gets to be on its bullshit forever, and I love that. And like it doesn't care. Like mash these things up. Yeah. And it has it has legit character arcs too. Um so yeah, go read that. It's fun. It's 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 wholesome. Um and if you want if you want to play a good thing, um uh Apocalypse Keys. Oh yeah. Thing. Yeah. Um I, so I started uh I started a Hellboy reread. Which then made me be like, remember, oh right, I backed Apocalypse Keys, so now <laughs> I'm I'm diving into that and trying to figure out how to work it into um, my role playing schedule. Um, or if you like a crunchier system, um, the new Pathfinder Second Edition revision re- rehash um, revamp, forget what they're calling it, uh, two point five. Um, it yeah. just dropped, and they 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 streamlined the rules and they removed any semblance of connection from um watsy which that controversy was also this year 2023 has been like five years yeah yeah like at some point the 20s have to stop like stop trying to cram all of your ideas into one yeah. novel we we stop don't try to cram to so many everything in one, one season no we 
let us let us escape from the discourse minds, please. <laughs> Can twenty twenty four be a novella? Just, yeah, yeah. That's that's all I'm asking. Yeah, yeah. No, I I I do, I wouldn't want it to be anything shorter than a novella. Like, but yeah, that has other implications that I don't want. Yeah, to talk about, but yeah. Uh, finally, before we get out of here, Josh, where can our listeners find you? Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> if you want to perceive me online, I don't know why you would want to do that, but if you want to, um, I'm at Solus um, on pretty much all social media, um, Instagram, Blue Sky, that's S-O-L-E-S-S, uh, which is a remnant from my very first D&D &D campaign. He was the big bad evil guy in my nice. D, D campaign talking about man <laughs> Fringe. Anyway, that's where that's where I am. Um, I'm all. I've also got a website, uh, Fantasy Punk um, Fantasy with a PH, because I guess I can't stop being extra about. Yeah. Uh, no. No. As as the former uh, author behind the Urban Fantasy with a PH mm. blog oh, yeah. for there for we go a good five six years. I'm right there with you. All right. Well, I, I feel like I'm good in good company then. So yeah. Well, fantastic. Josh, it has been so much fun having you on the podcast. This has been so fun. This is, this is the first time I had been on a fun podcast that wasn't for my day job, which is... <laughs> <laughs> we love to make a fun podcast. Truly one of the best things in the world. It, you were, it was a wonderful experience. Highly recommend. 10 out of 10. 10 out of 10. Thank you so much. Listeners... Stick around in 2024, because somehow that's the next thing that's happening. Uh, we, we've got guests. We've got guests coming up in 2024, like uh, uh, Prima Muhammad is going to be on in February, and uh, Joe Miles, and we also have our annual uh, awards eligibility roundup coming out in a few weeks. So... If you haven't subscribed already, please do subscribe. We'd love a review, five-star rating, especially on Apple Podcasts, because that's, like, somehow still the podcast place. You know, where, wherever you do it, please do it. We love... But Apple Podcasts is, like, the place where people find out about things still, somehow, even if they don't have Apple devices, I guess. Or word of mouth. So, you know... Tell, tell the internet, tell a friend. Tales from the Trunk is mixed and produced in beautiful Oakland, California. Our theme music is Paper Wings by Lillian Boyd. You can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash trunkcast. All patrons of the show now get a sticker and logo button, along with show outtakes and other content that can't be found anywhere else. You can find the show on Blue Sky at TrunkCast, and I post at HB Bisniex. If you like the show, consider taking a moment to rate and review us on your preferred podcast platform. And remember, don't self-reject. <laughs> <laughs>